Although I already did one of these little Sunday school thingies, I want to do another one. I just want to hurry, cause I just want to hurry and get through these. That's all. That's gonna be the last one for today, though. But here we go. Favorite Bible chapters: Colossians 2, lesson 39, and Obadiah, lesson 40. Introduction: The Church of Colossus was started in the house of Philemon, a wealthy man who was a close friend of the Apostle Paul. It was a good church, and Philemon was a good man. I don't know. I don't consider someone a good man if they have slaves. But oh well. It was this same Philmon whose servant Onesimus had stolen from him and escaped. Having met Paul in prison in Rome, Onesimus was led to Christ by Paul and was sent back to Philmon with a letter from Paul seeking restoration. If Epaphras, who was from the church in Colossae, was Paul's fellow prisoner in Rome. From him, no doubt, Paul had learned the state of the church at Colossae. It was a good church. But a few things had crypted. One was angel worship, and it's accompanying legalism. Anything had added to salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on Calvary. This letter to the Colossians was written by Paul to combat this legalism and angel worship and to show that Christ is best of all. In Colossians 2, he especially hits the legalism in an attempt to exalt Christ. Let's notice the teachings of this chapter. 1. Christ is everything. A. He is, full, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. B. We are complete in him. Colossians 2.10 And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. C. We are, we are circumcised in Christ. Colossians 2.11 In whom also ye are circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Here Paul combats the continuation of the ordinance of circumcision by explaining that the circumcision that we have is of the heart through Jesus and no longer is a circumcision of the flesh necessary. Two, Paul tells, tells that the ordinances are passed and done away. There are several things that are no longer necessary or valid for the Christians to do. And yeah, it does that. Colossians and also in um, the uh, Book of Romans, you know, it's pretty clear, you know, that Christians are allowed to eat shellfish and stuff like that. And, you know, all that, well, you can't wear clothes or two different things. Uh, the New Testament pretty much makes it clear that Christians can do that. You know, it pretty much tells you that. So when you tell Christians that, they're going to look at you like you're stupid for a reason. There are things that they have done. But Paul was steering the people from, from them now that they have Christ. In other words, now that they have Christ, they do not need these things. One of these things is meat. Under the law, there were regulations concerning meat. There are no such regulations under Christ. Unless, of course, you're something advanced. You'll say, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean what it says it means. you got to go back to Leviticus. Under the law, there were regulations concerning holy drink, holy water, etc. Colossians 2.16. You can go to King James Bible online, not order if you want to see these verses for yourself. There are no such regulations under Christ. Under the law, there were holy days such as the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Trumpets, Pentecost, etc. Now there are no holy days. Paul is telling us that every day is a holy day. Observing Lent is no longer necessary. Observing special seasons and special days is no longer necessary. Good Fridays, Easter Sundays, Christmas days, etc. are not to be holy days. We may pick a particular day when we thank God for the resurrection, but to say that this is the day on which He was resurrected and to make it a holy day is no longer necessary. In fact, it is forbidden. Notice the new moons and the Sabbath days. These were observed before, but not any longer. The Sabbath day was the Sabbath day. It began at 6 p.m. on Friday night and ended at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. The Jews could not so much as pick up a stick or light a fire in their houses. And that's what's so funny to me about Seventh-day Adventists. They all say, you still got to keep Sabbath. You still got to, of course, and the, the Bible doesn't say that, okay? And in the New Testament, it's pretty clear that, yeah, that they don't. And the Old Testament makes it pretty clear it's for Israel only. But we're not going to get into that. But my point is, they still drive places. They'll drive. They'll turn on the light and stuff like that. But they're not allowed to do it. In fact, the Bible says they should be put to death for it. These Sabbath days were nailed to the cross. Christ is our Sabbath. Of course, we go to church on Sunday. <coughs> but Sunday is the Lord's day, not the Sabbath day. All of these things were nailed to the cross. Since Christ has come, there are many... Other things that we no longer do that Paul could have added here. Three, Paul tells us that what was done to these things. A, they are blotted out. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
be, they were taken out of the way. The way to heaven is through Christ. See, they were nailed to the cross, which means they are dead. At one time they lived, but now they are dead. Christ has come, and all rituals were nailed to the cross. D, they were spoiled. Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. They are now rotten. They stink. They have been spoiled. E, they have been defeated. F, they are a shadow that has passed away. Conclusion, the entire book of Colossians is to tell us how wonderful Christ is. Notice these passages, Colossians 1, 15 through 19, and Colossians 2, 19 tells us that he is the head of the church. Unless, of course, you're a Catholic, then Jesus is not the head of the church, it's the Pope. Catholics believe that the Pope is the head of the church, whereas the Bible tell, does specifically tell you that Jesus is the head of the church. Go figure Mary, verse Colossians 2, 10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We get come to Obadiah 40. Introduction. Though not whatsoever is told about Obadiah in the Bible, his name means servant or worshiper of Jehovah. It was a common name among the Hebrews, but nothing else is known about Obadiah. There are several Obadiahs in the Bible. <clears throat> it was like our common name, John and James, etc. This one chapter book of Obadiah is occupied with one subject, the punishment of Edom for his cruel and brutal conduct toward Judah at the time of some great national calamity. It is divided into two different sections. One, verses 1 through 16 tells of the destruction of Edom and the causes thereof. Two, verses 17 to 21 tell of the salvation and final victory of Israel over Edom. And of course, these black Hebrews believe that Caucasians are Edomites. Nothing in the Bible says that. You know, all these religious folks can pick any book of the Bible and say, well, see, this is us, this is them, this is our God's help. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit is always speaking to everybody, telling them what they want to hear. It's amazing. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Remember that Esau was a hunter, the outdoorsman who sold his birthright to Jacob for a mess of potash, and whose blessing Jacob received because he deceived his father Isaac. And God's fine with the deception, too. That's what's so amazing. The same Esau married an Ishmaelite. The Ishmaelites were descendants of Abraham and Hagar, the Egyptian bondwoman. God's people were not to marry outside of their own race. Hence, the wife of Israel was from a mixed marriage. Israel himself had a mixed marriage. From him came the Edomites, a hybrid race which caused a lot of trouble for, to God's people. The main thing about the book of Obadiah, however, is that fact, that fact that God is going to judge Edom because of her treatment of Israel. Let's notice some of the things that she did. One, when Judah was reduced to her low, lowest state, Edom rejoiced in her calamity beheld her disaster with malicious satisfaction and did not come to her rescue. In other words, though the Israelites were descendants of Jacob and the Edomites were descendants of his brother Israel, there was no aid. In fact, there was delight to Edom and the enemies and the plunder and murder of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I doubt the Edomites, or the people who they call Edomites, thought of themselves as being descendants of this Jacob and all this crap. In other words, she fought against God's people. This is never right. God's people should never fight against each other. Three, the Edomites joined with Moab and Ammon in an invasion of Judah at the time of Jehoshaphat. And of course, if you remember, Moab and Ammon is the... Uh, when uh, Job got raped by his two daughters. Which, of course, the idea of a guy that's passed out drunk being able to father two children while he's passed out drunk, that's just laughable. Second Chronicles 20, verse 22. In other words, they fought against the people of God. Notice, they joined the Moabites and the Ammonites. Here is an unholy alliance. For the Edomites plundered the king's palace in Jerusalem and slew his son. Second Chronicles 21, verse 8, 17 and 17. Joel 3, 19, Amos 1, 11. <clears throat> All right, the Edomites were always on the watch to smite Judah and to carry away captive. Second Chronicles 28, 17. When Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, the Edomites gladly joined the invaders. Ezekiel 35 and Ezekiel 36 5. They helped the plunder. Conclusion the Edomites were rather safe from attack. The territory occupied by Edomites, you know, and it gives you some of this stuff. In memory verse of Obadiah 15 For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done. It shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Wow. See, this way, you know, by going over these a little bit like this, I can get through them a little bit faster. 
Now it gives me about 25 more and that's, you know, almost done. Bye.